Okay, here we are. One of the most important topics of our age, <laughs> online safety, online citizenship, all of these things, and this illustrious crowd who braved the siesta time <laughs> after lunch to listen to this. So thank you, <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, so first of all, let's just uh, kind of get into without retreading history very much. But I mean, we all, um, we don't really need to revisit the context of what's going on online in terms of the negativity and the toxicity. I think most of us here are very fully aware of that, especially if we've been in the game industry for any length of time, or even not even in the industry, but even playing games for any length of time. Uh, we know about episodes such as Gamergate, things like that. Um, according to the Pew Research Center, they recently did a study in which they said 59% of teens say they have experienced some form of online harassment in some way. So in, in just to kind of start off with a general high-level question, mm -hmm. um, do you think that the, in general the online environment is getting better or worse? Or what's kind of, what would be your state? So I'm going to sit on the fence and say I think we've peaked. So um, I, previous to coming to work for Roblox, where I am now, um, I worked for the UK Safer Internet Centre, um, and there I ran helplines helping people who were experiencing those issues online. And some of the things I saw and some of the stories I heard were horrific um, and probably couldn't get worse. And I think if we kind of start with, it can't get worse, it can only get better, then that's a good place to start. Um, there's more attention being paid to it all. So mm. I think um, industry really are taking much more responsibility for two reasons. One is because they want to be good and they want people to have a good time, but also because they're being made to. And we have to be really honest about that. So um, many of you will have seen <coughs> lots of coverage in the media all over the world recently around, you know, talk of regulation, um, you know, the duty of care and potentially uh, senior executives and companies being held criminally liable for people being harmed on their platforms. That's quite a good motivator. Mm. Um, you know, when it comes to data and things like that and protecting people's privacy, there's financial um, penalties. So I think all of those things, but also most of the companies, they want their users to have a good time. So um, I sat on the advisory boards of Twitter and Snapchat and Facebook Women um, and Roblox before I came to work here. Um, and I would work with the trust and safety teams and the policy teams and, you know, they were some of the best people I've met. Their commitment to keeping their users safe, you know, was absolutely 100% there. But what we're talking about is human behavior. And whilst you can have amazing tools on platforms and you can have a commitment to try and make it safe, until we can actually work with the humans who are behaving in that way, <laughs> then I think we're always going to have a bit of an issue. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I mean, as we know today, I mean, the majority of people have access to digital media, I mean, for a tremendous amount of their day. I mean, like, there was another study that showed that um, like U.S. adults, for example, spend at least 11 hours a day interacting with digital content in some form, whether it's email or uh, Netflix or video games or whatever. So where they are in some kind of online space, um, they're in some kind of community. And so obviously the digital content that we consume is part of our culture. I mean, it's part of what we do now. Um, you know, even with some mediums that used to be not digital, now they've transferred to digital. Um, but in these spaces, I mean, we know that in society we have laws and that govern human behavior to a certain degree with the cause and effect. So if you go up and threaten somebody on the street, you can be arrested for that. Um, and yet if you threaten someone on Twitter, it might be free speech or satire or something. So where do you see, in terms of the, the legal regime or the accountability regime, I guess, so to speak, um, it sounds like we're trying to do better, the companies yep. are trying to do better, but how do you see that connection or maybe disconnect between like the legal regime that affects the real world versus the digital? I mean, I think criminal behavior is criminal behavior. Hate speech is hate speech, and it shouldn't matter where it happens. Freedom of speech is a different issue. People have the right to have an opinion. So I don't like certain things, and I have the right to say I don't like that as long as it's not a personal attack. And I think... The second you go over that, then that should be dealt with appropriately. Um, I think the first thing that we want to see from platforms is if they have a code of conduct or um, community standards, then deal with what you say you're going to deal with. So if you say, we don't tolerate anti-Semitism on our platform, then we want to see you really proactively dealing with that mm. and quickly and effectively. Um, and I think that's the bit we weren't doing before. Mm. People were saying, these are the rules. 
please, please don't gamble. Please don't say things on our platform. Please don't share, you know, certain imagery. But people were, and nothing was being done. So I think if we can start there and say, we will hold you to account for the rules you've signed up to, um, that's, that's a good place. Mm. Um, Cooperation amongst platforms, I think, is really key. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're really proud of is, you know, we work with organizations like the Fair Play Alliance, where we're all together sharing good practice and helping to innovate, um, using the technologies and sharing the technologies that are out there. And I think, you know, for you guys, those are good places to be because you really will learn and have access to things that perhaps a small studio might not be able to do on their own. Um, and that's really good. And I think <clears throat> trying to build a healthy community is more than one platform. So for us, we might have a bad actor on Roblox who is just going out of their way to cause trouble. There's no point us just banning them because they'll just go somewhere else. So it's about trying to work together mm -hmm. to try and change that behavior or encourage change. You can't always do that. But I think also if we collectively say, so your behavior is not appropriate on our platform, mm. but then if they went and did it somewhere else and weren't banned off that platform, what message does that send? So equally, you have to kind of have the same robust sanctions in place. Right. No, that's a great point. I, I mean, I know that during the height of Gamergate, for example, I, I got a lot of frustration expressed to me from law enforcement. So like as being one of the targets, because I was running the International Game Developers Association at the time, I had daily death threats and all that other stuff um, that was going on. So I was in touch with the Federal Bureau of in Investigation, the FBI in the United States, and you know, communicating with them about what was going on. And, you know, so I would, like, I, to Twitter, I took, like, all, I took a great sampling of really, really, the worst of the tweets at me, and I sent them to Twitter, and I said, so what do you guys think? This has to violate your terms of service. And they said, no, they don't, unfortunately. It's just, you know, we don't know if it's free speech or satire and all that, and when I talked to the FBI about it, they said, you know, now, because I would take, like, one threat, for example, they said, if somebody said this to me on the street, you could arrest them, right? And they said, yeah, of course. But on Twitter, it was like, we don't know what it is, really. Plus, they, were, they had a lot of frustrations because they say if they're underage, in the United States, for example, the federal det uh, um, detainment system, they can't detain youth. Mm -hmm. They don't have facilities for people under 18. Um, and there's all kind of other issues. So it, it was interesting that the law enforcement people, they were just as frustrated, you know, because they, they, felt, they felt the same way, that it, criminal behavior is criminal behavior regardless, yet they, they couldn't really see a way to do anything I about think, it. I think, and, and that's something reflected that's not just in the States, you know, that's, that's yeah. the same everywhere. So in the UK at the moment, the National Crime Agency have set up a gaming roundtable group where we all share good practice around protecting minors, around sharing information about bad actors, potential grooming, and all of those sorts of things, mm. um, <clears throat> which I think is a really positive step. Um, coming at it from the other side, from an industry point of view, sometimes the frustration is, you know, where law enforcement can be quite vocal, but actually they don't always follow the right steps to get the information that they need as well. So I think that conversation, that certainly, you know, the idea of it takes a village. Yeah. You know, we all have to work together. Um, everyone has to play their part, and I think it's okay for law enforcement to be frustrated with Twitter, but mm -hmm. equally, I know from working with Twitter that they're like, we would really love to help you with this case, but you haven't asked us, you haven't mm -hmm. provided us with a court order, or, and yeah. so I think if we can somehow build those bridges, it would be really helpful. Yeah, no, that's great. So let's talk about Roblox. I mean, you're the world's largest platform for young people yep. and games. And so obviously for you, online safety and security and fostering an inclusive environment is like absolute in, in every way. So what's your approach? I mean, how do you ensure that? So we're purely user-generated platform. We have around, well, well over 50 million experiences on the platform. Every one of them has been created by our young developers. So we provide the infrastructure, the servers, the safety and moderation tools. The rest of it is designed by kids. Mm. It comes out of their imagination. Whatever they think they can build, they build, and then other people go play their creations. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. Um, you know, for us, play is the most important thing in the world and having fun. But with that comes a responsibility. And obviously, we, as the platform and as the host, have that responsibility. So we kind of look at it from several angles. So we have very practical tools. So we have a very young demographic of players, generally. Most of, most of the kids who start on our platform are like seven, eight. Mm. 
Um, they may stay with us and age up and then be the developers, tend to be in the teens. And now we have some of our most successful developers are in their early 20s, have their own studios, and are making loads of money, which is <laughs> wonderful. Um, but we have to make sure that we're being mindful about what's appropriate for each age. So obviously, for the very young ones, we have lots of parental controls. Um, so parents can have pin-protected access. They can turn off chat, for, for example, because we have in-game chat, text chat. Um, they can curate which games their children can play, those sorts of things, if they're under 13. Mm -hmm. Older than that, we want the kids to have a bit more freedom. Um, so things like the chat filtering will be less restrictive. It's still there, um, but you know, it's not quite as, as, as tight as it would be for the little ones. Um, we have around 800 moderators wow. in our safety team. Um, we have uh, moderators all over the world now. Mm -hmm. So we provide 24-7 and localized language support. So recently, we've just rolled out um, much more formally in France and Germany. We have um, people working covering Spain and Latin America um, and Korea, and we have Chinese support. So, wow. you know, we, and, and of course, a team back in the US. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's important for us around having that localized support, mm -hmm. understanding nuances. So our, our text filters will pick up basic swear words and things like that. But actually, sometimes there are little um, localized things we may not understand that are really offensive or could be kind of banter, but still not appropriate for our platform. And so having those teams on the ground locally is really helpful for us. Mm. Um, we also, in terms of the game development, so obviously there are certain things that are just easy for us to pick up. So certain you know, names of games or characters and images and things like that we can pick up. Um, but we actually human moderate every piece of content that's uploaded into a game. So any audio files or, or pictures um, or video content is human moderated before it's allowed on the platform mm. as well. Wow. That's so a, a lot real of work. commitment. Yeah, that's a tremendous amount of work. Have you found that um, to what degree is the community self moderating? So, like, do they, like, even with the younger kids, I mean, do they, will they point things out or will they point out behaviors or content that they think might be an issue? Well, let's start with. You know, self-regulation happens on most platforms, none more than where there's a community. Now, our community, they play together. We have two aspects to our game. One is the, well, three, creation, play, and socialization. So, you know, they are a community. Most of our growth comes from word of mouth. So some kids might see some YouTube videos or hear about it from someone else, and the next minute they invite their friends to come join them. They meet in the same way that they would have met in a playground, Lots of kids aren't even allowed out after school now, but they are allowed on the Xbox. So they will now go, right, let's go hang out. And they will play games. They might move from a couple of different games on the platform, but they're chatting the whole time with their pals. Mm. Um, if they're having a bad time, they will leave really, really quickly. Mm. They will tell those friends who also won't come back. You know, and conversely, if they're having a good time and it's a safe and positive experience, not only will they keep coming back, they'll tell more friends their parents will probably get invested in it as well and therefore allow that, oh, it's okay, I don't mind you playing on that game, but I don't want you on that game. Mm -hmm. um, and so that happens all the time. Mm. In terms of some of the bigger issues around development, so one of the things I saw, um, Block Evolution Studios, um, as some of one of our success stories, and they, they're, you know, they're really inspirational, they're great guys, they met at university, but they've both previously been Roblox players, they got a bit bored mathematics and robotics. Uh, and so they were like, right, let's, let's go off and make some games. The first game they made went absolutely interstellar within like two days. Wow. Um, they were so happy, so excited. Then they made another one, equally successful. Third one, they went in, made it really complicated. All that too much design, not enough user experience stuff. Um, you know, monetized quite a lot of the aspects of the game. Mm. Completely, completely crashed. And they were like, well, we learned a lot. In fact, we learned more through that one experience than having a success, because what we <laughs> realized is, you know, exactly that thing. We built what we thought would be a great game. We weren't listening to our audience. Mm -hmm. We weren't thinking about what they actually wanted from it and what Roblox was about, and it completely went wrong. So I think <laughs> that kind of regulation as well is, is, is there. People have to learn through the platform. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, just by contrast, I mean, is there any... 
Have you seen, like among other companies, um, where they approach online safety? I know for some, they kind of treat it, I think everyone treats it seriously that I've interacted with, but some of them, it, it's, it's not their top problem, obviously. It's like their top problem might be shipping the next game or whatever it might be. Yeah. And the community piece is often tacked on. Um, I know a lot of community managers in the industry who feel like they are shell-shocked and some have actual PTSD because of what they have to deal with on a daily basis. So I'm kind of wondering, how does the Roblox approach differ? Do you do anything that's significantly different from a lot of companies out there when it comes to whatever might be a typical approach? I don't know if there is a typical approach to this kind of thing. No, I don't think there is a typical approach, and that's where the problem is. Yeah, okay. um, And the more that we can all work together and share ideas, I think we can only get better. So mm -hmm. that's one. Um, so for us, you know, we're really lucky. We have very young kids, mainly on the platform. Like, we use the word toxic. Kids are not toxic, yeah? They might, they might do the odd thing, they might say the odd mean thing, but they do that in real life. This is still where they're learning. Mm -hmm. You know, they're still learning how to communicate and that it's okay to not agree with everyone's point of view. And for us to just steer them in the right direction, that doesn't make them toxic. So I think that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of who's good at this sort of stuff, I think it's really difficult. One of the issues we have is with chat apps that are very popular with gaming communities, for example. Now, we know we all spend quite a lot of time on them. And they're really, they're adult platforms. They're places where adults can go and have adult conversations. And it's not for us to say that that shouldn't be allowed. Mm. But when you have eight, nine, and 10-year-olds also on those platforms because they want to follow a certain server, that's really not helpful. It's really not suitable and it's not help helpful. So in terms of how you moderate those platforms, it's really difficult because they're going to have different standards than us. Mm -hmm. So as I say, it comes back to that thing of if you say you're going to have these things in your rules, then make sure you act on them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, try and help the broader community understand whether your platform is suitable or not. Don't just turn a blind eye. Right. Well, I'm wondering too, because one of the things I hear often, very often, especially maybe not as much from, in, sometimes inside the industry, but more so from people who are gamers and people who play you know, games uh, in the community, is like, if we just make everything, if we take anonymity away completely, then everyone, everything's gonna be fine. Um, if everyone's using the real name, then all the behavior is going to be fine. Nobody's going to put themselves in jeopardy. Everyone's going to know them, that they're an, an asshole or something. Um, what do you think? Do you think an getting rid of anonymity actually is going to solve these problems? I think that's the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we were talking over lunch. One of my closest friends lives in Syria. And if she had to put her name to everything that she's put on social media since she's been back in Syria, mm. we wouldn't have many conversations. Mm. So I think, you know, there are times Arab Spring was another example where people's anonymity was keeping them alive. Mm -hmm. um, LGBTQI people, you know, those sorts of communities, they need to be safe and being able to speak anonymously online. So I would never want to get rid of that. I think there's a difference between being anonymous and being accountable. Mm. You know, no one's truly invisible. It doesn't matter if you're anonymous online. We know that any of us can pretty much find out who you are and where you are. Mm -hmm. um, so I think educating people around that, it's okay to be anonymous, but it's not like a blanket that you can suddenly go out and be really offensive to people because we will come and find you. Mm. Um, just the general kind of education message, which I know is pretty boring, but it is really <laughs> important. You learn, you know, from a young child, when you're out in the playground at school, you learn all of these skills. They still have to learn those same skills when they're playing games. Mm -hmm. And the same applies to teenagers. You know, it's still that aging up. Every day is a lesson. Every day is an example of, you know, what would happen if you did go up and say something to somebody's face? Well, they'd either punch you or get you arrested. The same thing's going to happen online. So how do you manage those conflicts, I think? Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's really important. But yeah, I don't, I don't think banning anonymity is the way. There is a balance, of course, around privacy. Mm -hmm. you know? So for our platform, we have young kids, so they can't share any personal information anyway. That, yeah. that would actually get them excluded off the platform if they did. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So one of, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that I think this is leading to is the idea of when you start young, like in your community, which I think is pretty unique throughout most of the industry, 
Um, you're dealing with, with kids who are being exposed to these better practices. Um, they're being exposed to an example of how you interact with other people online. Um, so how does that play into this concept of digital citizenship? So, you know, the, we're, you know there's a, kind of a movement that I've been seeing where and hearing about where people are trying to, rather than just talk about online safety, anti-harassment, all that, which is all important, it's more about that fundamental, going back to your earlier comment, that it's, it's more about human behavior. How do we change society? How do we change people's perception of what you do online and what is appropriate online versus what you do? in the, quote, real world. Um, so how do you see this notion playing out? I mean, do you, would you see Roblox as being one of those places where digital citizenship could be effectively taught early on? I think, yeah, because we have such young users on the platform, kids that age, A, they want to talk about what they do online, so that's great. You know, straight away you have that opening, so talk to them and listen to them. Um, they already have those nice human nature skills of empathy and kindness. And so we just want to encourage that and bring it out more. Mm. Um, being really good role models. So we do a lot of stuff with parents. Parents find this really uncomfortable. Um, like most platforms who have really, really good tools for parents, parents don't very often use them. Mm. Um, we're all busy. You know, at Roblox, most of us are parents as well. And I think that informs some of our safeguarding practices. But equally, we know how busy we are. So I think developers and, and studios have a responsibility to kind of force feed this stuff to parents. It's not, it's not an optional thing. You need them involved. Um, but just making them aware. I mean, the thing is, you know, this is all back to the idea of all gaming is about having fun and playing. Mm -hmm. So the best way for a parent to support a kid is to go and play with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this isn't about sit them down and have the chat with them. It's actually <laughs> about going and being the, in the world that your kid is in and understand what they're experiencing. And that doesn't just apply for the little ones, that's for the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. Schools are a really big issue. Um, obviously, there is a huge amount of conversation about online safety for schools, and normally it's like a sit down once a year, have this big assembly, talk about paedophiles, and that's it. <laughs> um, and obviously, that's not what the real harm is. You know, for most young people, that's not going to happen, and that's really good that that's not going to happen, but they are going to have some horrible harassment sometimes and some horrible bullying, and, and we need to give them skills to know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. But particularly when you're a gaming company, to go to a school, we want to come in and talk up to your kids about gaming. They do not want that to happen. I think we're very lucky because of the nature of Roblox. The fact is, you know, we are an educational platform to start with. We teach coding. We teach other skills around gaming. And we have huge curriculums that we can offer to schools free. Mm -hmm. So they kind of, that's a sweetener. They will get us in to talk about that. And then we can drop in some of the other stuff. But if you literally just went in going, oh, I just want to talk about this fun game then it's really tricky. So <laughs> that's, that's another challenge we have to keep pushing. Well, I guess with parents in particular, it's kind of that notion, the saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Um, it's sort of the same thing. I mean, I know that we've heard a lot of complaints like in the in any rating system, whether it's Peggy or ES or B or whatever it might be, it's like the rating systems were created for a purpose to help guide parents and give them informed decision making. And how many times do parents actually look at the ratings? And I, I know that a lot of people I know in the industry will blame parental behavior. Um, you know, why do you let your five-year-old kid play Call of Duty Modern Warfare? And it's like, it's a good question to ask. It's the same reason why we have movie ratings. You know, you go to the, a movie and you see like an, uh, a really extreme movie, like a war film or something, and you see five-year-old kids in there that their parents brought them, and you're like, okay, hmm, I, I wonder about their parenting skills. I mean, that's a much bigger issue than we're here to solve. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it does bring up you know, kind of this careful balance that I think we have to address. And it's basically where, what's that balance between personal responsibility as individuals who play, as parents who have kids who play, and parents who play, uh, and additionally, especially with the generational change now where most parents today play games, um, whether or not they do with their kids or not, it's another issue. But that balance between personal responsibility and the corporate social responsibility, um, how do you see that playing out? Um, I mean, and that's what I said, it takes all of us. Yeah. We all have a responsibility. You know, even, even a 12-year-old kid has some responsibility for their behaviour online because at that point, they're a young adult and they know 
how they're meant to behave and we would expect the same standards from them that they should be doing at school or in the street or Mm -hmm. anywhere else um i don't think it's fair to blame parents because as i say many reasons not least you know kids generally are quite bullshy these days and there's a lot of pester power particularly around gaming Mm. all my friends are playing this game so you have to let me play this game we hear that all the time and it's really difficult and you know what like my son is not old enough to play certain games but he's absolute badass at Halo and has completed every game (laughs) and I'm not going to sit here and go oh well he shouldn't because he's not 16 you know that's just not the real world parents make decisions that are right for them our job is to try to make sure that they're making a good judgment and that they have enough information to make that decision Mm. Um, again our responsibility all of industry I think we ultimately have the biggest responsibility which is we can you know we can't 100% change people's behavior, but we can put the tools in to mitigate some of that harm. Mm-hmm. So, so speaking of those tools, what do those look like? I mean, is there one particular best practice or tool that you think could work? I mean, like if a company right now is not really doing anything, or if, even if they're an indie company, this is one of the big problems I've seen too with, with uh, indie developers who are just starting out and they have a game that's moderately successful, and of course they've spent all of these, this time developing the game, and now they have to deal with the community around the game. So what, where do they start? How would they get started with that? Well, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. This is, um, obviously we work with loads and loads of other gaming companies you can't tack it on afterwards. That is the point. Mm. Um, It is about from the second you start designing a game, you need to not just think about the user experience and the fun elements, but you do need to be thinking about that safety. What are the vulnerabilities going to be here? Obviously, it depends on who your audience are. If your audience is over 18, then that's fine, and the risks you're looking at are going to be very different. You're probably going to be looking at safeguarding financial risk, Mm. privacy issues, those kind of things. When you're dealing with children, then you definitely need to be looking much more at the kind of contact um, and communication type issues on the platform. But I think you just you just have to think about it right from the ground up. Mm. Um, you know, I think listen to your community because what the media tell you where the risks and where the issues are definitely isn't where the risks and the issues are. So talk to your community, listen to them, and actually hear. Like from us, we just did some some interviews with kids and just went, tell us what your experience is like on Roblox. Oh, my God, that's amazing. Do that. (laughs) Um, You learn so much, and it's quite hilarious. Um, And and then, you know, if they say, I'm really unhappy because this keeps happening, then do something about that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it's just around, there is no one tool that fixes everything. So we use machine learning, we use AI, we use text filters, we have human moderators. And I think whilst even the smallest games may not have big budgets for the technical solutions, you're all bloody geniuses, so you can build some of these things yourselves. Um, so I think where you can just have a variety of tools is the best bet. And would that tool, would, you, would that also include at least having one community uh, manager? Of you some always kind? need a human because machines are great, <laughs> but context is everything. So yeah, yeah. You, know, you, you absolutely need somebody where the buck stops who can, me- who can make that decision about human behavior and human nature because I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> Well, I, th- I think that's kind of akin to where, like, my background in culturalization work, helping developers with the political and cultural sensitivities. I'm, I'm, I have an association with a lot of localization people, and you know, they often see themselves as being like the bastard children of game development. We're, we're the last people, we're the last people to get, get that uh, they'll will get talked to about the game. And I think I know a lot of community managers who kind of feel the same way where they're feeling like, like to your point, is that they feel like they are tacked on at the end or like, our game's done, now we're going to hire a community <laughs> manager kind of thing and then figure it out as they go. Yeah. I mean, I think Twitter's a really good example of that. As I say, I, worked, I was on their advisory board for several years and worked with their team who were all amazing, but it doesn't matter how good the people are that are there, it was a little bit too little too late. Mm. You know? The behavior, the, the culture of Twitter was already set. So it's really, really hard to try to change that by even having the best team there and loads of resources put into it. Yeah. Um, the localization thing, I think, is really interesting. It's really important for us. Um, you know, Roblox has been around since 2005, but it still feels a bit like a startup. You know, we're, we're, we're suddenly exploding in growth, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, but I think the culture was still very US-centric. You know, North America was most of our market. By probably the end of next year, Europe will have overtaken North America as our main audience. Mm. 
So we really have to think about that. So the reasons that we've rolled out in France and Germany particularly is taking into consideration those cultural differences. Mm -hmm. So we not only translated games, but we can translate games, that's fine. But then we started working with developers on the ground in those countries to make games that were much more relevant for those audiences. Mm -hmm. The reason we have our moderation teams there is exactly that same thing. There are things, nuances we will never pick up. Um, in Germany, it's particularly difficult. You know, they're really, really strict about any violent games. And by violent, I'm talking about Roblox violent. You know, <laughs> anything with a gun in it is pretty much a no-no. Um, even games where you have car races or car chases, that can be seen as quite extreme. And they're like, oh, parents will ban that. Mm. Well, for us, that's like seven plus game. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I think just being aware of that and hearing that and then trying to work with the local areas to, to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. um, we work with safety partners across the world as well so that we have that same dialogue. So things like memes, you know, this is how we all communicate these days. Um, <laughs> and, you know, what can, what can be absolutely fine in one place is really offensive in another country. Mm -hmm. So we work with sort of safety organisations, safer internet centres and places like that so that they're saying to us, at the moment, this is a real issue in our country. Please be mindful of that if you're seeing it kind of popping up on the platform, and that's, that's really helpful. It tries to keep us one step ahead if we mm. can. Well, on that note, I just I was curious, I guess because I'm a geographer, I'm curious about this kind of stuff. Um, I am curious on an international scale. I mean, you already mentioned the efforts that differ from country to country. Um, do you feel that the, like the approach to online safety and security and, and basically that whole issue, how, how is it being approached in different countries or different regions around the world? I mean, I know the West is very steeped in it because it's something that we've been dealing with for a while, but have you seen uh, a uniformity in the issue around the world or does it differ quite a bit? Um, uh, I think it, you'll see it in different places. So Australia set up the eSafety Commissioner's Office. That was a really big deal when it was all about child protection. Mm. And then suddenly they realised adults have a shit time online too. So they kind of had to tack on services to deal with some of that. Uh, New Zealand, very similar, set up the kind of um, online harassment kind of support service. All they were getting was contacts about spam. Mm -hmm. um, so that wasn't really what they were intended for. I think there are trends. Um, very much one of the problems for me is that much of this is media driven. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in the UK at the moment, it's boring. Like every day there is something to do with something that happened on some platform. Um, most of the time there's very little truth in the stories, but government will go, that's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. Now, last, last week was a very difficult time to work in gaming. Um, some of our colleagues from other platforms got a real grilling from some ministers who were there just basically going, online harms, it's gaming's fault, you're terrible, loot boxes, blah, 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 blah. What are you doing about it? And it was not a nice time to work in gaming. Um, but we were all collectively sitting there going, actually, it's not us, and we can talk about the good <laughs> stuff we're doing, and it's okay. Um, but trying to have that conversation without that becoming, this is where the problem is, and this is what we're going to focus on, mm -hmm. because a lot of the funding, of course, for any of these services comes from government and places like that. So um, right. we need to kind of push back on the media a bit, I think, so that they report on the truth and not these sensational stories. Yeah. No, it's, it's kind of a similar problem where a lot of companies in the U.S. will get beckoned to the White House, they'll get summoned after yeah. some major shooting, which happens almost every day in, in the US, where they get called to the White House to explain why did you do this or why did you let this happen, which is, you know, that's a whole other conversation we're not here for. But, um, but yeah, it's that whole thing of, of the perception of, of the role of gaming yeah. is, as a cultural force. And, and to that point, before we're gonna, if we're, we are gonna open to Q&A shortly, so if you have questions, please think of them. Um, but, just speaking to the broader point of games as a cultural force, which we know there are, at least on our side, we believe that's what we are. And I think the numbers prove that, considering how much games make as an industry compared to film or music or other yeah. forms of entertainment. Um, you know, I guess in a way we, we can lead the way, more or less. And I'm curious if you see that, it, um, the role of games in general as an industry in actually changing the online behavior, because obviously it's not just a game problem at all. I mean, it's social media platforms, it's all kinds of other things as well, but um, how do you see games being instrumental to actually creating that kind of foundation we need? So we talk about the power of play. You know, from our, from our point of view, it's an essential basic human need. Mm. Um, 
both in terms of you know, how children use it to learn and have those experiences, but even as adults, we get home from work and you just want something to take your mind off it. It's escapism, it's fun, it's how, where we hang out with our friends. Um, and it's a really healthy, positive place. There are so many examples. Like on our platform, um, you know, we have so many stories of where it's a therapeutic process for young people, whether it be the design in the games or the play in the games. Um, you know, we, just last week, we heard from a young lady who um, was actually at a conference one of my colleagues was speaking at, and she kind of plucked up the courage to go and talk. And she was like, I've been really badly bullied, and I'm really isolated, and I have no one, and the only constant in my life has been Roblox, and I'm so thankful that you're here. And like, my boss just burst into tears, which is great. Mm. Um, you know, another, another young man that I was talking to recently, his dad sadly died from suicide. And his way of coping with that was to make a game to help him deal with his grief. But in effect, it also helped lots of other young people with their mental health and their well-being. It's gone on to be a really successful game, and it's given him that resilience and that control back and a way of dealing with his issues. Hmm. And well, we have so many of those stories. You know, that there is so much positivity in gaming. You know, a lot of, a lot of our developer create, um, cre uh, community have additional needs. You know, they feel very isolated in the real world. Mm -hmm. So actually being on our platform gives them their, their world that they're comfortable and that they can control. Mm. Um, and, and it's not just on our platform. We know that that exists in most communities. And I think the more we can shout about that, it will minimise all that conversation about toxicity because I think that really is the minority of what happens. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, it, that's one of the things that I've often spoken about in the last couple of years after I left my role running the IGDA is how I feel that the public narrative about our medium is something that we have not had good control over for a long time, if we've ever had control over it. And we really need to focus more on the positive in order to take back control of it because so many times we'll see these sensationalist stories like you mentioned about something that happens online or a shooting or something and they automatically blame video games. But rarely have I seen companies and or industry bodies actually speaking out very loudly, very quickly saying, hey, it's not us, you know, look at, I mean, we have this whole dynamic like in the US just as an example between video game industry and the NRA, the National Rifle Association, because anytime there's a shooting, the NRA, which has a tremendous amount of money to lobby the government, um, they basically point their finger at video games and say, that's the problem. It's not the fact that I can go down to my corner store, literally from where I live, I can go down to a corner store and buy a gun within 30 minutes. Yeah, that's not the problem <laughs> at all. So um, yeah, so there is basically building in that societal change and, and basically access to information, access to whatever it might be. Um, with that, I was going to see if we have any questions in the audience. Hopefully we have some comments or questions. Of course, we can't see anything up here. <laughs> but um, is there any, anything, any questions? There's one right here in the front. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was saying that I was asking uh, if there is any uh, game or narrative design uh, ideas that we should take into account when creating games. Because, for example, when Overwatch introduces LGBT characters, for example, I always think that must be really good for the community. But then all I read is uh, homophobes on Twitter shouting to each other, and it's pretty bad. So I wanted to know if, uh, besides moderation techniques, there's also more narrative or uh, design-oriented ideas that you may share? So I'll start with that. So I think the more that we can be inclusive, tolerant, and keep pushing that and keep putting those things in games, eventually it will, it's back to that, you know, being the positive, it will drown out those people shouting on Twitter. Let them shout. Um, I actually, the, the slight aside, but I had the opportunity to meet Megan Phelps, who was one of the daughters of the Westboro Church, the Baptist Church. Um, it was one of the most amazing conversations I ever had. She eventually left the church, but she was one of those people standing outside soldiers' funerals with placards and writing horrendous abuse to people on Twitter. And it was only because of the counter-narrative that she was always having of people going, 
actually, here's a different point of view rather than yours that we really don't agree with. And eventually that did help her to then start thinking for herself. And she made the choice to leave that really toxic situation that she was in. Um, but I think it's only by continuously pushing it. Don't give in. Keep thinking about what's right for your community. Not every game needs to be that inclusive. Um, but also just generally thinking about diversity, like women in games. Um, Roblox, about 40% of our players are girls, which is amazing. But we want those girls to carry on playing when they leave Roblox, when they're 13, 14, 15. We want them to be welcome on other platforms as well. So the more we can push that, the better, I think. Yeah, and I'll just add a quick comment, because in the work that I do, helping developers with the political and cultural sensitivities in their content, I often remind them that you, you are... Uh, you have freedom of speech. You are a creative artist. So basically, you can create anything you want to create, but you do, do need to be mindful of how that creation is going to intersect with the local worldviews of the different markets into which your game is going to be sent. And so if you don't care about offending a wide variety of people, go ahead and do it. Now, that's not going to reflect well on you as an individual and as a, as a creative person, um, and it will often create a, a kind of a negative reputation for yourself. Oh, yeah, he's the guy who made that game that pissed everybody <laughs> off, um, which, you know, yeah, a lot of people say there's nothing, there's no such thing as bad PR. I disagree. There is. Yeah. There is a lot of, there, <laughs> there is such a thing. Um, and so it's basically doing that balance, though. It's like, for uh, on all the game projects I've worked on, which is extensive amount of game projects, I'll often challenge them and say, for example, they have a group of characters and they're mostly white or male or whatever. They say, what would it hurt? Will it change the narrative structure to add a woman to that group or to add a person of color or to add an LGBTQ person to that group? Will it change the narrative at all? And usually the, the answer is no. It doesn't really radically change anything. And so I'm like, well, then just why don't you do that? That makes your game more inclusive. It makes, makes people see that you're open-minded about the kind of characters that exist in that world, unless there's a clear narrative reason why those kinds of people would not exist in that world. But that's the creative decision. I've worked on all the Bioware stuff of the last eight years, and I loved when I think it was for Mass Effect 2 when people were complaining about their lesbian relationship that was in the game, and I loved what they said. They just, they, people were complaining on Twitter and all that, and they said, that's the way the world is. If you don't like it, don't play our game. It's that simple. We're not going to change our game just because you're whining about it. Yeah. And, and just, uh, you know, on the actual moderation side of things and the, and the good practice, um, so safety by design is everywhere at the moment. So there's lots of work going on in Australia, around the UK, and I know collectively the Safer Internet Centres are involved in these conversations. So there are guides for startups around what would be the benchmark, you know, stuff that isn't going to cost a fortune, things you can just put in the game. Um, come grab me afterwards, I'll share some of that with you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Can negative opinions reinforce positive opinions um, of something? Like, if I think this thing happened in some game or movie or show, can I give my negative opinion to, I don't know, make the creators or whoever has watched, played or done this thing think about it and say, well, um, maybe I'll do this thing with these tweaks so it can be better for me and this random guy. Can it happen? Um, I mean, we're really lucky on Roblox because the young people who make these games they're always evolving them. They're always updating them. And they very much, they're so active on social media. You know, part of the success of these games is they, they don't have loads of money to be promoting them professionally. They're promoting them by word of mouth, by getting influencers to play their videos, if they're lucky. Um, but other than that, it is just being part of the community and listening. So quite often, you will see them going, oh, we are actually making some of those changes that you told us you want us to make. So I think you can influence it. But if you can't influence those other games, go make your own. That's yep. how you're going to make the change. <laughs> yeah, and as I always tell people, if you're going to if you're going to give feedback, be constructive, constructively blunt, as I like to say. <laughs> 
So you can be honest because I think it's good to be honest with your feedback, but don't, don't say you people are incompetent or you're idiots and I, I hate what you create and all that. That's, nobody's going to listen to that. But if you say, hey, I love your games, but here's some things that I, that I wish you would have fixed or done differently. And if it's constructive, that's great. Pe most people will read that. Whether or not they change it, that's their creative choice, but at least you were able to express your opinion. It's basically, we used to use the word, we called it civility, being civil to each other. That's my job title, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Hey, um, I have a question. You talked a little bit about text chat and moderating uh, text chat. I'm wondering if you could speak about voice chat because that's harder to moderate and also it's um, worse for women. So I can't speak to that because Roblox doesn't have voice chat on the platform at all. Um, obviously, if people were to use other platforms like Discord or whatever, then they would be using that. But obviously, we can't moderate or manage that. So I'm going to hand this one to Kate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a really tricky one. I mean, I was still at Microsoft when Xbox Live um, went live. And I remember even from the earliest days, the voice chat problems that were going on. Um, there's a reason why I think for many of us, especially women, we turn our mics off. Um, you know, because typically I, I still play Halo. I worked on some of the Halo games. I love Halo. I'll go on there and I'll play and I'll get all kinds of comments. They'll just see, they'll see my gamer tag, which is Valkyrie Kate, and they'll see, you know, well, that must be a woman. And then if I play well, which if I play long enough, I'll get in like the top three in a match or something, and then I'll either get you know, several messages saying, go back to the kitchen, you know, you suck. I'm like, I kicked your ass, I don't suck, you know. Or I'll actually, maybe one in 20 times, I'll have someone, a guy message saying, hey, you did great, thank you, you know, good job, let's, let's be friends on here. But um, the voice chat thing is a huge problem because, I mean, obviously it's live. And to moderate that kind of live chat, I mean, text chat it is as well, but like, like Laura was saying, there's actually tools that can help moderate that on the fly, where with voice chat, it's a whole other story. And so basically, voice chat in its current state usually is something that has to be moderated after the fact. So it's something, someone said this to me, um, it got recorded, now I have to report the person, now I have to wait for the moderators to listen to it and then respond to it. So right now, I don't think we have really good tools for that. I mean, there are some AI-based tools that are emerging that might be able to help with that kind of stuff, but even then, I mean, it would have to catch it in real time as it's being spoken, um, or they just put everything on a delay. Yeah. Minority report, you know, we need to be able to see yeah. it in the future. <laughs> um, I think, you know, one of the other things is about being part of your own community. So, you know, Kate, you're talking about when you're playing games, and I play games too, and when I'm in that community, be an upstander. If you hear something, call it out, and the more of us that stand together, yeah. it will be the minority who are the ones who are bad actors. And then collectively, it's scary the first time you call someone out, but actually, the second that your friend stands up with you and says, actually, no, I agree with them, that's really out of order, yep. that is how we affect change. Uh, it has to be consistent, and everyone has to play their part. And I, I totally agree with that. that. I've seen that be more effective than anything else. Rather than having like a heavy-handed moderation from the platform owner, it's basically the community itself. So if there's a match and somebody's harassing this woman who just came into the, into the matchmaking and you have like three guys speaking up saying, hey, dude, just cool it. It's not, you know, you don't need to do that. That's been more powerful than actually having some moderator come in and say you're banned. Thanks. Any more questions? There's one. Hello. Um, how much do you think uh, having a diverse team um, uh, affects the games that come out being protective and safe and diverse in, in itself? Um, yeah, I think all platforms have responsibility. I think anywhere where there are multiple games being uploaded, it makes it more challenging because you can't moderate everything before it's uploaded. Um, again, pe people have different tolerances of what's OK. So I think if you feel something shouldn't be there, then you do something about it. Um, but equally, building those communities, you see so much good practice. It's back to that self-regulation thing. You know, the, There's a collective mindset of people who go on those sort of platforms, and I think that's quite a positive thing. So 
Um, and I would just add to that, I think what diversity brings, if you have diversity of people working on it, what it brings is diversity of experience. It brings basically a broader sense of empathy, which is really important with dealing with these kinds of issues. Because if you have people on the team who've never experienced any kind of huge amount of harassment or problems online, then they may not have the empathy for the issue. But if you have people who from, from a wider diverse backgrounds, um, who have experienced this kind of thing, oftentimes that empathy will get built into the design of how you actually deal with the problem. I think maybe we have time for one more question if somebody is brave. I cannot see. There's one up there. Uh, I have a question. Um, as a woman who plays games, something I typically do is I'll change my name to be gender neutral. I'll choose a male avatar. It's something I've always done. And I'll turn off the mic like you said earlier. Do you think this actually helps the situation? Does it make it worse? Is it just a way of avoiding you know, those negative kind I mean, of it's, impacts? It's really, I'm so glad you said that. So first of all, thank you. It's really sad that you have to do that or that you feel you have to do that. And I think it's great for everyone else to hear, to hear that that's a real life experience because we hear that all the time. Um, I would never say you're not helping the situation because it's not fair to put an individual in that place. Um, I think the more that it doesn't matter how we identify, I can understand why you would make that choice and, and that kind of echoes Kate's point. Conversely, my partner, always plays as a female avatar. I don't know why, I should probably look into that at some point. Um, but you know, but from his point of view, I think people would just assume that he's a man. Um, and it's really interesting looking at it from that perspective. So I don't think you're not helping the argument, but we shouldn't even be having to have that conversation. Um, so certainly, you know, on, on children's platforms where we do encourage, you know, you can be anything you want to be. You can, you can make your avatar look like whatever you want, as, as real life or as fantastic as you want it to be. Um, and obviously, we encourage using totally made up names for our characters. So those sorts of things can help. But actually, some people really want to identify as a very proud female gamer, and I want to be able to be me in my avatar, and I want to use my name online. Um, so I think the more that we can just keep fighting it and kind of going, that's my right, but we don't expect everyone has to do the same, I think that's fair. Yeah, and, I, and I would, the only thing I would add to that is just, it's, it's basically comes down to, the, to uh, maintaining your own sense of wellness. I mean, you don't want to do something that's going to put you out there and make you feel threatened. If you're going into the game environment just to have fun and relax, then do what you have to do. Um, if you use a gender neutral name, use a male avatar, whatever it takes to basically make sure that you can have a positive experience, I think that's great. And back to that old thing, if you can be a unicorn, be a unicorn. Yes. <laughs> and I think with that, we are done. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks, guys.